Now, you know, I've been in higher education for more than 30 years, and I'm proud to say I started that at the age of 22. So you can add it up, and you know where I stand. <laughs> and I know how women who serve us leave us more informed. They leave us better educated. They leave us more well-rounded and more prepared to deal with the challenges and opportunities of today. You know, at Prince George's Community College, 68% of the 44,000 students we serve are women. So we are preparing women to take the places of many of you who are sitting in this audience every day, to become true leaders and providers and givers, not to just Prince George's County, but to the region, to the state, and to the nation. Uh, you know, we held what we call the Real Women's Summit at Prince George's Community College in 2011. And as I looked across the audience, there was a man in the room. And he's a, a, an administrator at the college. So I leaned over and I said to someone, what is he doing here? Because it was the Real Women's Summit, so we wanted to have some real conversation. And so they went and asked him. They said, the president said, why are you here? That wasn't quite what I was expecting them to do, because it was a rhetorical question. But his response was, because women are leading this college and leading this county, and I need to know what women think so that I can get ahead. So you know, I promoted him. You know, so, and like many of you who, who represent your places of work, your communities, your neighborhoods, the organizations to which you belong, we're going to be partnering with the state's attorney, Angela Also Brooks, as she looks at creating a sister summit at the county level. You know, we have sisters, four sisters, sisters, two sisters, the links, sororities, you know, and you know, I couldn't stand up here without saying something about Greekdom and womanhood. I couldn't stand up here and not uh, say something about my sisters in Greekdom, those who are members of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority, Zeta Phi Beta sorority, Sigma Gamma Rho sorority, and the love of my heart, need I say it, Delta Sigma Theta sorority incorporated. Ooh, that's what we do. Now, and you know the list goes on and on and on. As women, we are doing so much in our communities to ensure that there is a quality of life, not just for our families, but for our neighbors, and for those families that sometimes seem as though they don't even care about their children. All of these programs and more serve to continue to connect us to one another so that we can use our talents, our skills, and our mother wit to help others. Now, sometimes I don't know about you, but I wonder when using common sense went out of vogue, because I, I just don't believe that we're operating today in a world that relies on common sense, the kind of sense that I was raised on. I know how powerful it is to have a mentor and to be nurtured by those who have traveled the road before you. If we've already been on the narrowest, bumpiest road ever created, but have come out on the other side unscathed, maybe scarred, but still able to be strong, then it's our responsibility as women to share that with the other women whose lives we touch every day. Our grandmothers, our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, our nieces, our granddaughters, and what I call our sister friends, to help them navigate and make healthier choices. Now, but all of you know that Women's History Month exists to, to help to draw attention to the women who have fought for the rights that we have today. And it also helps us to simultaneously highlight the ongoing struggles for women's equality. While this month was originally meant to bring the world's attention to women and our challenges worldwide, I think now it's an opportunity to celebrate the achievements of women and the positive changes that have come about in contemporary America and the world. However, you all know that there's still much work left to be done. So, now, can we talk about equal pay for equal work? Can we talk about blowing up the glass ceiling? Can we talk about the oppression of women in communities and countries across this world? I know we don't have time today to talk about a lot of that, but I think that we ought to continue the conversation because too many of us talk about what we would do, but we don't talk about what we can and are doing. 
Now, let us not believe that the fight for women's rights is over. It is a social and educational justice issue. We cannot afford to, in the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, sit down and just be sick and tired. We have got to stand up and be sick and tired of being sick and tired. Now, you know, even in the midst of all of this, and we know we have work to do, and I know that we are all committed to that work, there's a lot to celebrate today. And I went back and I looked at Therese Yule's book, The Women of Achievement in Prince George's County, and I found out that women have been an integral part of and have had a profound effect on the history of this county in which we live. She said that history is both our door to the past and our window to the future. For to see where we are going, we must first examine where we have been. Her tome highlights the contributions of women in Prince George's County for their commitment to professionalism in the workplace and to the quality of life for all of our residents. Women like Barbara J. Miller, who was a women's rights advocate, who had been very active in the county in government and civic associations since moving here in 1963. Her contributions to, to the county range from volunteering for the Red Cross to assisting military personnel wounded in Vietnam as they arrived at Andrews Air Force Base. She attended Prince George's Community College in an effort to advance her career, and she left the college with honors and transferred to the University of Maryland University College, where she graduated magna cum laude with a bachelor's degree in business management. She served as the executive director of the Prince George's County Commission for Women, and during her tenure, she organized chapters of the Older Women's League and the women business owners of the county. She also developed the Prince George's County Women's Hall of Fame and unsung heroine programs in celebration of Women's History Month. Now, another woman pioneer in the county was Sue Fryer Ward. She was honored for her belief in giving back to the community. She managed the volunteer tutor program in reading throughout the county, and she promoted reading for volunteer programs all over the state of Maryland. She was appointed to the Board of Social Services by then County Executive Win Winfield Kelly in the late 1970s, and in 1982, she co-chaired the ex County Executive's transition team and was later appointed Director of Aging. Now, one of the counties and the college's very own, a native Prince Georgian, Alonia Sharps, was highlighted in that same book for her strong interest in the welfare of others and her entrepreneurial spirit. Now, many of you know Alonia, and I'll tell you how. Because as I travel throughout the county and the region and the state, people come back to me and they say, you know, we've been trying to meet with you for months, but your handler <laughs> is very difficult to get through. That would be Alonia Sharps, just so you know. She said she makes it very difficult to get to you. And I said to them, no, what she's really trying to do is get you to the people who can make a difference for whatever partnership that you want to have with the college. But you know, Alonia has almost single-handedly improved women and minority representation among the college's administration and faculty leadership. Today, almost 70% of administrators at the college are women. Or, or persons of color, and within our faculty, I believe we have almost 40% who are persons of color, and then it's probably 60% when you talk about women who are teaching in our classrooms. So these women of achievement, and you who are here too, are women of achievement right here in Prince George's County. You speak to the fact that within our neighborhoods and our workplaces, that exceptional women walk among us and beside us all day. And we all work hard to improve the lives of the generations who are to come. It proves that the stories of women are integral to the fabric of this county. Learning about women's courage, tenacity, and creativity throughout the centuries is a tremendous source of strength. Again, if we don't know where we've been, how do we know where we're going? They provide essential role models for all of us and all of those who will follow us. So as I close, I hope that you're beginning to catalog the ways that you can impact the lives of the young women, where you live, where you play, and where you work. As I shared earlier, 
I am deeply committed and believe that it's our responsibility to make sure that the generations of women who come behind us will be more informed, better educated, and more empowered than we ourselves might be. I if I don't know you, it doesn't matter that the work I do ought to be laying the foundation to make your life better and the life for your children better than it is today. So, I, you know, I'm concerned about the future of our young women. I'm concerned about each of you seated in this room because if we don't stand together and stand tall, I don't know what kind of laws, rules, policies, or regulations will come out of Washington, D.C. And I would tell you that an, that an empowered woman knows who she is. She knows herself and she understands her strengths and her weaknesses. She knows what she wants, she sets goals, and she knows how to reach them. She makes connections, personal and professional. She has a network of people that she can count on, but more importantly, that network can count on her. Lastly, an empowered woman empowers others. She doesn't pull people down. You know, this is not about crabs in a barrel. She lifts people up, and she helps them to discover their full potential. She stands up for the things that she believes in, and she steps up and out to accept the challenge of serving others. It is my hope that all of you will continue to be courageous in your quest to better your communities and the lives of the people who live in them. I hope that you will decide that helping another woman change her life is the right thing to do. Reap some great rewards for doing that. And I would leave you with this in the words, again, of our own Sojourner Truth. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, then women together ought to be able to turn it right side up and back again. We are ready to do it, and men better let us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It is an honor to take this opportunity to introduce this year's Gladys Noon Spelman Scholarship recipients. There are two. First, Ms. Kawanda Robinson. Kawanda is a senior at Potomac High School. She has a GPA of 3.84. She plans to major in occupational therapy. Here's what her guidance chairperson said at Potomac High School. Kawanda is a commendable student. She has always demanded the most rigorous selection of courses possible, often taking advanced placement classes, even in subjects that she was unaware of. Outside of school, she has taken an interest in many academic subjects out of a love for learning. Congratulations. Our next 2012 Gladys Noon Spellman Scholarship recipient is uh, Laquania Whitmire. She's a senior at Fairmont Heights High School. She has a GPA of 3.88 and plans to major in forensic pathology and biochemistry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what uh, Counselor uh, O'Neill Marshall at Fairmont Heights said about this young lady. She, he said, quote, I have had the good fortune of knowing her for approximately three years. Now, during this time, I have found her to be persistent, conscientious, and gracious. She refuses to quit. She is goal-oriented and focused and does not allow distractions to get her off course. When things become challenging, she works that much harder. Those are the words from the counselor at Fairmont Heights High School. A round of applause for you, too. Just a little bit more now, and congratulations to both these young ladies. This year, we received outstanding applications from county students who attend Prince George's County Public Schools, private and parochial schools. Thanks to Karen Lynch of Prince George's County Public Schools for working with us to promote the Gladys Noon Spelman Scholarship. 
The, school sh the scholarships rather, are awarded in the spirit of Gladys Noon Spellman, who served as the Prince George's congressional representative for three terms beginning in 1975. She was a tireless fighter for the people and had a strong interest in the fields of politics, or political, and social sciences. Again, these two young people ultimately were selected to receive $2,000. So we are proud to salute them and wish them the very best in college and their future endeavors. Please join me again in uh, applauding their achievements. And we do have another major award recipient to recognize this afternoon. This award is the Gladys Noon Spellman Public Service Award. A little background now on the candidates. All candidates nominated for this award must be women working for the Prince George's County government and residents of Prince George's County. All candidates must have progressed steadily in their careers. Each must also have outstanding outside interest, including exemplary community service. Finally, each must possess strong leadership abilities and apply these to the betterment of our county government. There are some dynamic and committed women in Prince George's County government, and we applaud each and every one of them. But right now, we pause to recognize those who were nominated this year. I'll ask you to please stand, and so we can recognize you. When I call your name, Marilyn M. Bland, Clerk of the Circuit Court for Prince George's County. Sarah Bolden Carr, Department of Environmental Resources. Joanne Carter, Department of Environmental Resources. Gwen Clerkley, Department of Public Works and Transportation. Teresa M. Grant, Department of Family Services. Bridget Ann Greer, Office of Law. And Lieutenant Colonel Virginia McCotter Jacobs, Department of Corrections. Also, Deputy Chief Javonia Whittington, Prince George's County Police Department. A round of applause for all of the nominees this year. Let me read you a little bit about who was selected this year. She has over 20 years of service in county government. Through her professional and personal activities, she has been and continues to be a tireless advocate for the citizens of Prince George's County and beyond. She is an engaged county resident, valued employee, and citizen that has truly earned the trust, confidence, and respect of all who know her. Whenever there is a committee or organization with a mission to better Prince George's County in some fashion, the very first phrase that you will also hear is, we better get... Her involvement and commitment are so widely recognized and synonymous with, it's going to be a success. She always steps up to the plate and gets the job done effectively effectively. Moreover, she is a person of great perseverance who has weathered an extremely arduous and dangerous medical condition which she never allowed to interfere with her single-minded commitment to her professional and civic responsibilities. Despite her personal trials and tribulations, she has distinguished herself in her 20 plus years with the county's attorney's office by successfully defending and protecting the county's interest in numerous complicated, difficult, and often unpopular cases. Her colleagues have witnessed and benefited from her overarching drive to better the county, its government, and its citizens. She has steadily progressed through government, first serving as a dedicated law clerk in the county attorney's office, then as associate county attorney, and later a senior legal counsel and equal employment officer for the fire and EMS department. Through her distinguished tenure with the county, her scope of ever-increasing responsibilities evidences the respect afforded by her superiors. In addition to her successful professional career, she believes in giving back. She is a volunteer for the Ronald McDonald House, tutor for prospective bar exam applicants, and previously served on the board of directors for the Bonnie, John, Cho Bonnie John's Children's Fund, where she proudly helped raise thousands of dollars to help families, and children. Additionally, she is a committed and active member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. 
Would you like to do this, this honor? <laughs> oh. We can do it. You, you can do it? <laughs> <laughs> I can do it, we can obviously. And the winner is Bridget Greer. Bridget! Thank you very much. I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity. Um, over five years ago, when the doctors told me I had one year to live, I thought that God was playing a cruel and unusual joke on me. But then I realized I can take my ordeal and turn it into an opportunity to witness to those about God's wonderful mercy and his amazing, his amazing, his amazing grace. I strongly encourage each of you, and I strongly encourage you, if you haven't considered it, please consider being an organ donor. If it wasn't for someone becoming an organ donor, I wouldn't be standing before you here today. The doctors gave me five years post-transplant, and on March 14th, it would be six years. So I encourage each of you to become an organ donor. You save lives and you change lives. Thank you, and God bless you.